if you could life coach the church, and if the church could be honest enough to come to a coach like you and say, man, we are struggling. We got to really change our game to really meet the need. Sure. But where would be your start? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Poor, the place where we serve faith and culture together. And today, a life coach is going to change my life right here on the set. Let's get to it. You didn't think I was going to put that much pressure on you. No, I was going to say that's a lot of pressure right now. This is Ashley Schultes, who is a life coach who has an incredible story. Before we get to that, though, it is a tradition for us to present a drink. We had some extra sparkling ices. You come into people's lives and you sparkle it up. There's no sugar, but probably tons of chemicals. Cheers. Cheers. Good chemicals. Thank you. Winning. We're already winning already because the last guy brought his own booze. Why dare you to put one of those in your water? Right now? A lot of people might not know what a life coach is. You're not a therapist. You're not a consultant, but you're like a coach. But you don't like have like a helmet on or a baseball cap and a whistle. You're no. not screaming at someone. No. You're like a life coach. Yeah. You're going to coach the life. Right. Why would someone go to a life coach? Because life can get really unorganized, feel very overwhelming, out of control, and it's how do I organize, prioritize, and make sure I find myself in the process and stop losing myself. Get back on track to life and your life purpose. Now I have a feeling that the reason why you're doing this is because you have a story of your own. Maybe you needed to do this, this, this to get back on its <laughs> Own. I went through a curveball of a divorce. With that, it's okay, how do we pick up the pieces and rebuild and grow and make your future what you need it to be to support you and the kids? Mm. And that's what we had to do. It was open the business, all about action, and literally take action. So does that mean that a lot of people, when they're in a rut and they're stuck, mm -hmm. uh, is because they're just an inability because of a life event or something they're going through that just they get stuck in their tracks and they just can't take action and therefore that creates the rut? I mean, sometimes it can or sometimes there's so much going on in life and it feels very overwhelming. Where do I start, right? I have all these great ideas. I have all this stuff I want to do. Sounds a little bit like this this, this show that we had big dreams. It's going to be a late night talk show on a, on, a, on a main network and you just got to take action. You said before the show, small actions are... Digestible bites. Here we are with no budget, drinking <laughs> sparkling ice and we're growing. We had a studio on member last episode. It's phenomenal. You went through this curveball and was it overwhelming? It was a total shock. It was survival mode. What was a great experience of that is that woman that I let lead the path during that time. She was the survivor. She is the doer. She is what's next. Let's get this done. How do we get through this? When I'm in bed crying, uh, don't want to get out of bed and then my eight month old woke up from his nap and he's crying and somehow I have to stop that and go take care of life because that's what's happening. That woman, that survivor led the path, got me out of bed, got me to do those things. She doesn't serve me today. She doesn't need to drive the bus. So she'll keep me cold, close off from the world, so resilient, so alone, such in fight or flight mode, and she doesn't have to serve me today. Persona or part of you that that rose up that was more crisis management. Yes. And now, thank you for all that service. Exactly. Now explain to me how you shifted to this the new empowered Ashley take action. So you just take the best parts of that survivor okay. in you and you let go of the parts that keep her cold or um, closed off or things like that. You get in more in touch with your true self. Like I am kind, I'm compassionate, I'm willing, and I'm also resilient and strong and capable and smart and resourceful. So you kind of blend them to make your own little warrior and let that person lead. So did you do this all on your own or did you have a coach who coached you through this too? No, I just did it on my own. So you coached yourself? Sure, just get it done. So there's a bit of like a life is happening yeah, and you have a choice to either sit and wallow or just get it done. You chose the latter. Did other people start to recognize this, this ability to reinvent and thrive. People have always said, I don't know how you've gone through what you've gone through and, and composed yourself. So it's also lead by example. You can't coach someone if you don't know how to manage or pivot or do life either, or try to, sure. right? We're all trying our best. But I've always had a natural like calling or purpose to want to help other people. I assume that you have a decent amount of your clients who are also dealing with, wow, my, it seems like my life just kind of fell apart. I see that with a lot of my female clients, it tends to be they're in a transition period of life, whether it's the kids are kind of not as dependent on them and they're like, I've been momming so much and so long. Who am I and what's my purpose? And I have time now to do it. What am I going to do with it? A lot of my male clients try to 
uh, put on the persona that I got this, I'm good, but they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders and have absolutely zero outlet and are afraid to actually show that outlet and then that too, the pressure. So as a church, we're always trying to figure out what is the the heartbreak that's happening out out there like out yeah. in the culture what are some of the common themes you're hearing about people with like the relationship world relationships with kids a lot of the husbands and wives they both feel kind of overlooked or unappreciated okay. where maybe the wife might not understand the amount of pressure the husband puts on himself to be able to provide and show up, act as if they have it all together all the time. Wives also not feeling as appreciative. I go to work, I run that ship, and then I'm at home and I'm running this ship and I just need some help. How do you get a dad to realize that mom is momming and mom is full-time jobbing and we need to have some recognition of this huge plate that's in front of us, because I see mm -hmm. this a lot. How do you coach around that? Yeah. I think it starts with leading with kindness and appreciation. The more appreciated you feel, the more you're just gonna give that off. The more maybe disrespected or overlooked or not cared for or not a priority, you're not gonna want to show appreciation. So even if it's just Sunday night check-ins, like what's important on your week this week? Do you need any help or support with that? Do you have a big meeting that's coming up that's rocking your world and you're super stressed about? Should I just let you have your time right now? Talk about those things that's the other person's dealing with. Can you ever just say though, like I'm doing 80% of the work around here. How do you approach that without a rough conversation? Sure. Because the other person probably feels like they're doing 80% of the work. So why is your 80 more important than their 80? It's not, Ooh. they're equally dependent on each other. We just want some acknowledgement and praise. Both okay. parties do. Church is going through tremendous change. You yourself have experience with church. If you could life coach the church, and if the church could be honest enough to come to a coach like you and say, man, we are struggling. We gotta really change our game to really meet the need. But sure. Where would be your start? So I feel like society has changed where we're a lot more accepting. Two judgments don't make a right. But I feel, and this is a judgment, yes, yeah, yeah. that sometimes, you know, Jesus was hanging out with thieves and homeless people at the bottom of the barrel and did everything with them and for them, if I remember my teachings. Yeah, yeah. However, as an adult that has a lot of knowledge and I would make a judgment that sometimes some Christians or some religious people might have some very low tolerance of, let's say, homosexuals or different people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't attract a person like me to the church. Mm. We're taught the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. But I don't know if all people in an organized religion do really treat others mm. the way they want to be treated, just because they might look or be different. Would you say that you hear that same thought from yeah. others when they are critical of the yes. church and why they might not attend? Yes. Do you think that if a church really practiced that golden rule and really led with that kind of love, that could be a shift? If they really had a feel that I could go there and not be judged, the first thing they're going to do is love on me, love on me. Yes. There would be hope. However, I think the church does do that. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I just think the members of the church might mm -hmm. be the only person, the only Christian that that person's come in contact with. What we experience so much out there in the world with our religions is, is these, these lines get drawn and judgment gets thrown around. The love gets maybe second, third, or fourth. It's mm -hmm. like more, you've got to be this tall to ride this ride. And if you go through <laughs> all this, then we'll get to the love part. Is that something innately within us is that we just have to lead with more of an exclusivity first? I think it comes down to like having healthy boundaries. You can have certain beliefs and, and certain boundaries, but I, I even experience this with myself is like I realized with a certain situation I had really rigid boundaries and when you have such rigid boundaries and you're not allowing room for growth so if I change those rigid unattainable boundaries to healthy boundaries there's room for growth what I'm hearing you say very is that the, <laughs> the, the church right now uh -huh. might have rigid boundaries so that's not allowing it to hear a new thing mm -hmm. or some growth or just to hear the people it's serving? Possibly, yeah. And it's about listening, being in those places that you might think the church wouldn't welcome someone like that. If you could give me guidance right now as a priest in 2024, what would be your kind of pep talk? Follow your passion, listen to your truth, right? There's a fear inside of us and that will talk us down or it'll make us want to conform to what we know because that feels safe. But right now, things are changing, and you are willing to tackle that, which is a gift. Not everyone's willing to tackle that. Yeah. So follow that gut instinct and go to where you might not typically go. What will the church look like in 25 years? Don't know how big it would be. <laughs>
just has to adapt to what society needs it to be. All right, cheers. cheers.